Good evening, everybody. My name is Carla Durand, and on behalf of the Collegeville Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research, and this evening's host, St. John's Abbey, I would like to welcome each of you here to tonight's lecture being given by Dr. Catherine Clifford. As many of you in this room know, 2017 will mark the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's 95 Theses, the doctrinal challenge that launched the Protestant Reformation essentially splitting Western Christianity. Yet, the title of Kathy's lecture, Remembering the Body, Joint Commemoration of the Reformation, points us in a forward direction even as we acknowledge this 16th century dispute. Tonight's lecture has two aims. One, to explore the significance of the joint ecumenical commemoration, and two, to look closely at the celebratory points of 50 years of Lutheran-Catholic dialogue. In this year of mercy, Kathy will help us better understand what the Reformation can teach us today and how we might recommit ourselves to give a common witness to the mercy of God in service to the world. A few words about Kathy. Kathy is professor of systematic and historical theology, as well as the director of graduate studies at St. Paul University, Ottawa. She holds a BA in religious studies from the University of Waterloo, an STL from the University of Freiburg, Switzerland, and a PhD in theology from St. Michael's College, Toronto. Her teaching and research are centered on questions of ecclesiology and ecumenical dialogue. Her recent publications include Decoding Vatican II and Keys to the Council, Unlocking the Teaching of Vatican II, which was published in 2012 by the Liturgical Press and was co-authored by former Collegeville Institute resident scholar Rick Gallardi. That book won two significant book awards one from the Association of Catholic Publishers and another from the Midwest Independent Publishers Association. Kathy serves on the joint working group between the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Canada and the Canadian Catholic Conference of Bishops. She is currently in residence at the Collegeville Institute and will be on campus through the end of this academic semester. I have three housekeeping notes before we delve into the lecture. One, we will have some time for conversation, questions and answers after Kathy's presentation. And when we, get to that the, when we get to that point, I invite you to use the microphones that we have here so that your questions and comments can be fed through our recording equipment. Secondly, we do have some representatives from the liturgical press who have made available for sale some of Kathy's books. So if you're interested in purchasing something, you could see either Hans or Tara here at the liturgical press table after the lecture. And lastly, we invite you to join us for a little reception afterwards. We have some wine and a few snacks and some coffee and drinks in the back. So we invite you to um, stay in fellowship for a bit afterwards. And so with all of that, please join me in welcoming to the podium, Dr. Kathy Clifford. Thank you very much. I want to uh, begin this evening. I want to put on this other microphone. I think I'm on? Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. I want to um, begin by expressing my gratitude to the Collegeville Institute, to St. John's University and to the community of St. John's Abbey for your gracious hospitality during this semester of my research leave from St. Paul University. I deeply appreciate the opportunity afforded me to spend this time with you in a context of both study and prayer. And though I realize this has been somewhat of an atypical winter, it's been nice to get a break from the bleak winter of Ottawa, Canada. They're getting another six inches of snow this week. I've chosen to speak to you this evening 
about the joint commemoration of the Lutheran Reformation in 2017. On October 31st of this year, Pope Francis will travel to Lund at the invitation of the primate of the Lutheran Church of Sweden and Arch, uh, uh, Archbishop of Uppsala, Antje Jacqueline, who's portrayed here, uh, uh, together with the leaders of the Lutheran World Federation. Together in October, they will lead a joint liturgy to begin a year of commemoration, recalling Martin Luther's call for the reform of the Western Church, when on that same date in 1517, as a young Augustinian friar, he posted his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. I'd like to reflect briefly on the connection between memory and identity, and then consider the nature of this commemoration. This 500th anniversary represents an unparalleled opportunity to enter intentionally into the process of conversion that is integral to the healing of Christ's ecclesial body and to the reconciliation of our divided churches as we grow towards full visible unity. Once every 500 years, it's an opportunity I don't think we want to miss. <laughs> so, and as Carla mentioned, I think this is coming year also marks the 50th anniversary of formal theological dialogue between the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church. Any of you who followed these conversations will know that the Lutheran Catholic dialogues at the international and regional levels, including the US dialogue, have been engaged in rigorous and thoughtful work contributing greatly to the growing consensus and renewal of our churches. So I will propose a brief overview of some of these developments, drawing your attention to what I think can be some helpful resources um, uh, as we reflect together in this year. Um, I, because of the time, it's not possible to enter into a lot of detail into all of the specific doctrinal issues, but I, I wanted to draw to your attention some points that I hope you'll agree really show some uh, key moments of changing our view of one another and our, our understanding of our relationships. I'd like to begin, though, with this insight from the Dutch poet Cory ten Bloom. Corrie and her family were imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp during the Second World War for their efforts to protect Jewish families from deportation. They knew firsthand the power of memory, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Memories are key, not to the past, but to the future. These words suggest that memories are powerful and formative. However we choose to live by them, memories are constitutive. That is to say, they shape us, our personal and collective identities. So the way we enter into the future is largely shaped by the way we choose to remember the past. Now, despite the tremendous access to information that the internet affords us today, North American culture is often characterized by a remarkable propensity for forgetting. History no longer finds a place of pride in the basic curriculum, leaving generations of North American vulnerable to the simplistic tropes of reality TV and the uncritical ideal ideologies of the blogosphere. As if to compensate for this loss of collective memory, one of the most frequent uses of the internet today is for genealogy. Family genealogies are important in the quest for identity. Returning to our family roots helps to answer the questions, who am I? Who are my people? How did I get to this place? And what can that history teach us about where we might be headed? In a time of instability, 
knowledge of one's roots can be a source of strength and inspiration. But that same knowledge can also point out sources of dysfunction, conflict, and old wounds. It can bring light to the forgotten branches of the family tree and instruct us on how we might do better in the future. I mentioned at the outset of this that I came, come from Canada. Canadians are known in general as quiet people. We tend to be also quietly patriotic. When I was a young graduate student studying in Europe, like many of my compatriots, I sewed a bright maple leaf flag on my backpack. It said, I'm Canadian. But it was also understood to signify not American. <laughs> Full disclosure here, <laughs> it's true. Uh, we have to say, to be honest, as that many Canadians will define themselves by saying, politely of course, no, I'm not American. We speak the same language, Americans and Canadians, roughly. <laughs> but we do come from different cultures, and we have a different heritage. A couple of years ago, I began to trace my own family roots in greater detail. The lineage of my great-grandmother on my mother's side was quite obscure. And so I began to trace back through early census data, records of marriages, births, deaths, maps, land claims. And I discovered that Etta Mae Richardson, my great-grandmother, whom we knew simply as a poor farm woman and not a bad seamstress, was descended from one of the first settler families to arrive in Prince Edward County, Ontario in 1784. Her great-grandfather's family had been drummed out of upstate New York for having sided with the British during the American War of Independence. Officially recognized as United Empire Loyalists by the British colonial government almost a full century before the Confederation of Canada, they received land grants in compensation for their losses at the hands of the Americans. On the north shores of Lake Ontario, 10 new counties were mapped out each named for King George III's 10 children. And in the middle was a town called Kingston, the capital of Upper Canada. So I shared this knowledge with my siblings and my mother. We all began to walk a little taller. Belonging to a clan of United Empire Loyalists is a badge of honor for citizens of the British Commonwealth. And all of this, of course, reinforced that unspoken marker of identity. We are not American. <laughs> so I sat with this for a few months. But the researcher in me was still curious. How did the Richardson family come from Queensbury, New York? How did they come to be there? Four more generations of family records led back to Connecticut, then Massachusetts, and then to England, from which they had come during the Great Migration of the 1630s as early settlers in the New England colonies. Before being exiled to Upper Canada, the Richardsons had lived peaceably in New England for 150 years. I mulled this over for a while. Perhaps I'm not as un-American as I had thought. Perhaps I'm more closely related to many Americans than I was willing to consider. We are family, after all. Recovering these memories, rewriting that family history, has deeply altered my sense of identity and that of my family. That history and identity are far more complex than I might have suspected when I set out to fill the gaps in our collective memory. 
I want to suggest tonight that part of what we've been doing in ecumenical dialogue is going back together through our collective family history and reconstituting or correcting some of that memory. A complete and accurate knowledge of one's memory, a memory free from distortions, as far as that's possible, is essential to understanding who we are. My family genealogy project points out the pitfalls of defining ourselves by what we are not. That is to say, over and against others. How we choose to remember can shape not only our sense of self, but also our relationship to others and the way we face the future together. This applies equally to the Christian family tree. In the sad chapter of the divided churches, we have too often defined ourselves over and against our brothers and sisters in Christ. Until very recently, a strongly anti-Protestant note colored much of Catholic theology and catechesis. Until the Second Vatican Council, manuals of controversial theology were the go-to text in Catholic seminaries. Often, a disproportionate emphasis on things like Marian devotion, Eucharistic adoration, or papal primacy served to reinforce the great void that separated the Church of Rome from Protestantism. Similarly, a streak of anti-Catholic rhetoric ran through Protestant confessional statements and catechisms and extended into preaching and Sunday school lessons. The anniversary of the Reformation on October 31st each year was often an occasion for reinforcing in triumphal terms this anti-Catholic spirit. Reflecting on the common commemoration of the Reformation in 2017, the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity observes that for the Lutheran churches, previous centennial celebrations were often lavish and festive events designed to underline different confessional viewpoints, to retell the heroic epic of Reformation history in terms that would critique the Roman Catholic Church and justify Lutheran's distinctive existence. At times, Martin Luther was celebrated as, quote, the liberator from the Roman yoke, unquote, or as a German national hero. So this coming year, for the first time, in half a millennium, Lutherans are inviting Catholics and other Christians to join them in a very different spirit of commemoration. Now, after 500 years of estrangement, those distant cousins are invited to the family picnic. Now, this would not be possible unless we had grown together in mutual understanding respect, and in a genuine communion of faith and friendship. Because we have discovered the sacramental bond that binds us together in one family and one ecclesial body, Lutherans could not imagine remembering the events which led uh, to the particular formation of their churches without Catholic fellow Christians. That's a profound, profound change and development. An occasion that we, uh, that if we take advantage of it, can have important implications for our future together, provided we observe it with the appropriate spirit. In the opening of his 95 Theses, Martin Luther wrote, when our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. So we enter upon this anniversary as repentant sinners, grateful for the gift of God's liberating grace and humbly acknowledging that as individuals, 
And as churches, we stand in constant need of renewal and reform. We are individually and collectively simul justus et peccator. So we do not celebrate what divides us. It's not just, it, this is not an anniversary of separation. We're remembering the events that brought about that separation, but what we want to, to commemorate and celebrate together is what holds us together in communion. So we welcome the opportunity to remember together, to commemorate joyfully the faith we share, confident that we have far more in common than what divides us. Our common faith in Jesus Christ and our common baptism, that sign of his liberating grace and of our initiation into a life of dying and rising with Christ is cause for celebration. As members of one Christian family, we are a people shaped by the memory of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit. The life of the church is sustained by that constant recollection through the preaching of the word, the celebration of the sacraments, and the life of Christian discipleship of Christ's Paschal mystery. The memory of Christ dying and rising is made actual in each new celebration of the Eucharist. We have recalled our participation in that mystery in a more intensive way during this Easter season, and we do so each time we renew our baptismal promises. Whenever we remember the death and resurrection of Christ, we renew that covenant relationship that makes us a people, the people of God and Jesus Christ. So when Christians recall together the heart of our common faith, we engage in a remembering of Christ's ecclesial body in building up the church. Even if Lutherans and Catholics have not yet reached a point of being in full visible communion, each act of remembering in common is an anamnesis, an enactment of the communion we already share in Christ. Like the estranged cousins of a divided family, the road to reconciliation requires of us that we make new memories. Renewing together the grace of our baptism can open a path for God's reconciling spirit to continue in us the healing of the ecclesial body. So it's in this sense that we commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation. Some of you might recognize um, these little uh, resources that have been prepared uh, for uh, common study and to, to, to guide us um, uh, in this year of celebration. Um, the Lutheran Catholic Commission on Unity, which is the international dialogue, has prepared this resource from conflict to communion. And also, there's a, a book with a similar cover on it that contains the text of a common liturgy and resources for common prayer for commemoration events in the coming year. And the uh, ELCI, ELCA here and the US Conference of Bishops set up a special task force to prepare this little resource, a declaration on the way which focuses on our common understanding of church, Eucharist, and ministry with 32 points of agreement. And it's a bit of a reception document. These are helpful resources uh, for us to use in this coming year. I want to um, look at give a bit of a, a thumbnail sketch, an overview of some of the highlights of the progress that has been achieved through these 50 years. And I want to do so by looking at uh, the work of the Lutheran Catholic 
uh, International Commission. On June the 11th of 1964, Professor George Lindbeck of Yale University, who represented the Lutheran World Federation as an official observer at the Second Vatican Council, met with Johannes Villebrands, who at the time was the sec secretary of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity. And at that meeting, they discussed for the first time the possibility of a future dialogue. So a planning group met through 1965 and 66 to explore possible conversations and forms of collaboration. So that by 1967, an official Lutheran Roman Catholic International Commission was established to engage in serious discussion of theological or issues in order to, to quote, eliminate misunderstandings and causes of irritation. I think they've succeeded in doing much more than this. Its 1972 report, The Gospel and the Church, revealed important convergence on the gospel as fundamental criterion for the church's preaching and in the understanding of ecclesial authority being at the service of the word. Already, 1972, this early dialogue pointed to the possibility of, quote, far-reaching agreement in the understanding of the doctrine of justification, a recurrent theme in the years that followed. The report argued further that new developments on both sides warranted a revised judgment concerning the recognition of Lutheran ministries and a reevaluation of Eucharistic doctrine, including the practice of a limited Eucharistic sharing. These themes recur all through these 50 years of dialogue. So the gospel and the church was followed uh, shortly by two substantial doctrinal reports indicating a broad consensus on the Eucharist in 1978 and on the ministry in the church in 1981. Two statements were issued in about the same period to mark an, another, uh, other significant anniversaries. In 1980, All Under One Christ reflected on the 450th anniversary of the Lutheran confessional document, the Augsburg Confession. The title, All uh, under one Christ is taken from the text of the Confessio. When it was read before the Imperial Diet of Augsburg in June of 1530, the unity of the Western Church had not yet been shattered. Though issued in a time of conflict, the various parties were still committed to church unity. All under one Christ acknowledged the responsibility of both Lutherans and Catholics for the bitter polarization and division that followed, and made this important observation regarding the explicit intention that underlies the defining doctrine, uh, document of the Lutheran tradition. And I, I quote here at some length. The express purpose of the Augsburg Confession is to bear witness to the faith of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Its concern is not with peculiar doctrines, nor indeed with the establishment of a new church. Its concern was not with peculiar doctrines, nor with the establishment of a new church, but with the preservation and the renewal of the Christian faith in its purity in harmony with the ancient church and the Church of Rome and in agreement with the witness of Holy Scripture. All under one Christ argued that this fundamental intention must guide the interpretation of all subsequent Lutheran confessional texts. Just three years later, in 1983, Lutherans and Catholics marked the 500th anniversary of Luther's birth together with the common statement, Martin Luther, witness to Jesus Christ, where Luther, 
had once been regarded by Catholics as the personification of heresy and the fundamental cause for the fracturing of the Western Church, and by Lutherans as a religious hero and a founder of a new church, common historical studies of the Reformation and of Luther's writings now enabled Lutherans and Catholics to recognize him together as a witness to the gospel, a teacher in the faith, and a herald of spiritual renewal. Speaking to the Fifth Assembly of the Lutheran World Federation, Cardinal Villebrons, who was then the president of the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, acknowledged that many aspects of Catholic life now find better expression because the Second Vatican Council had at last responded to many of Luther's appeals for reform. These include the centrality of scripture in church teaching, the understanding of the church as the people of God and of our common participation in the priesthood of Christ, an understanding of ministry as service, the principle of religious freedom, and the recognition of the need for continual reform in the life of the church. Two other documents explored processes of mutual recognition and possible steps toward visible unity. The 1980 study, Ways to Communion, noted the extent to which dialogue, common prayer, and the historical study of theology and doctrine had helped to reduce prejudice, improve knowledge, and provide a fairer evaluation of the past and the present of both churches. It issued a call to remove confessionally conditioned prejudices and misjudgments of other churches from the entirety of theological research and consciousness as well as from textbooks of church history and systematic theology. And it noted the need to develop an ecumenical view of church history and the history of doctrine. I think, in a sense, you can see some of that ecumenical history in the document today that we have from conflict to communion. So these encounters between Lutherans and Catholics had led them, quote, from confrontation and polemics towards a dialogue committed to, joint, to a joint search for the fullness of truth. By 1984, the document Facing Unity could acknowledge that if Lutherans and Catholics had not yet achieved full mutual recognition, the emergence of significant consensus on a series of fundamental issues had brought them to envisage new forms of fellowship where once divergent traditions could no longer be the subject of mutual condemnation or be considered church dividing. The 16th century Lutheran conflict with the Church of Rome centered on the doctrine of grace, more precisely on the Pauline insight that we are justified by God's free gift of grace through faith alone, and not through any purely human effort or work. In 1993, the third phase of the International Lutheran Catholic Dialogue concluded with the publication of a wide-ranging agreement on the subject of the church and justification. This document set out to test the emerging consensus on the doctrine of justifying grace in the realm of ecclesiology, for Luther had held, he had set this doctrine as the article by which the church stands or falls. It's <coughs> deeply indebted to the work done in other Lutheran Catholic conversations. In 1985, the US Lutheran Catholic Dialogue had published a groundbreaking agreement on justification by faith. And in the following year, the German ecumenical working circle of evangelical and Catholic theologians opened new perspectives in a work entitled, The Condemnations of the Reformation Era, Do They Still Divide? All of this work laid the foundations for the historic signing of the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification in a solemn ceremony on October 31st, 
1999, another anniversary of the Reformation. This took place in Augsburg, Germany. By signing this document, the highest authorities of the Catholic Church, here represented by Cardinal uh, Edward Cassidy, president of the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity, and the communion of evangelical Lutheran churches, represented here by Dr. Ishmael Noko, then president of the Lutheran World Federation. By this signing, they declared an end to the central dispute of the Lutheran Reformation. While Lutheran and Catholic theologies of grace may differ in language and emphases, they have arrived at a fundamental agreement on the basic truths relating to the free gift of God's grace. The condemnations of the 16th century are no longer applied to Lutheran or Catholic teaching today. Consensus on these basic truths has set all other disputed questions on a new footing, those that concern sacramental life, ministry, the instrumentality of the church's institutions in God's saving plan. The joint declaration, a decisive step forward on the way toward overcoming division in the church, was not an exercise in forgetting. If the condemnations of the Reformation are said to not apply to contemporary Lutheran and Catholic teaching, they continue to stand as salutary warnings for future teaching and practice. The experience of seeking the truth of the gospel together has helped us to see them in a new light. Several decades of joint study and dialogue, of re-examining our common history, not to find fault with one another, but to set it anew in the light, to see it anew in the light of the gospel, have helped to heal our common memory and pointed us toward a new future together. It's possible to discern the traits of a common future in the study document of the fourth phase of work by the Lutheran Catholic Commission on Unity, the apostolicity of the church. If anamnesis speaks to memory of a liturgical kind, apostolicity says memory in ecclesial speak or in the language of ecclesiology. Lutherans and Catholics confess together in the creed that the church is apostolic. By this, we mean that mark or attribute of the church brought about by the Holy Spirit who unites, sanctifies, and maintains believers over time in continuity with the apostles' faith, teaching, and institutional order. When we call the church apostolic, we express a shared conviction that all of ecclesial life is shaped by fidelity to the message of Jesus, proclaimed by the first witnesses to his resurrection, set down in the scriptures, and handed down through the teaching, life, and witness of believers across time. The apostolic faith is a living memory that shapes the church in every age. Receiving the apostolic gospel in faith and handing it on is a process that embraces every aspect of ecclesial life and practice. The authors of this agreement observe that if Luther himself rarely spoke of the apostolic church, he understood that continuity in proclaiming the same message as the apostles entails continuity in practicing baptism, the Lord's Supper, the office of the keys, the call to ministry, public gathering for worship in praise and confession of faith, and the bearing of the cross as Christ's disciples. Lutherans understand this manifold of elements belonging to the ecclesial life as keeping alive the memory of the apostles' faith. 
The study then links this broad notion of apostolicity to the Catholic recognition in the teaching of the Second Vatican Council of the corporate ecclesial reality of other churches and ecclesial communities when it affirmed that many elements of truth and sanctification are found outside its visible confines. These ecclesial elements, including sanctification of God's spirit, um, sacred scripture, faith in the divine trinity, baptism, Eucharist, other sacraments, devotion to the mother of God, and the witness of martyrdom. These are all listed in the Constitution on the Church and the Decree on Ecumenism. These are presented as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ. According to Vatican II, to the extent that such gifts are present in the life of other Christian communities, Catholics recognize that the one Church of Christ is present and operative in them. The Lutheran Catholic dialogue contends then with good reason, and here I cite again uh, a good paragraph, Catholic ecumenical theology is justified in concluding to an implicit recognition of these churches and ecclesial communities as apostolic, since the very elements listed are not meteorites fallen from heaven into the churches of our time, but have come from Christ through the ministry of his apostles and are components of the apostolic tradition. Beyond our common sharing in Christ's salvation by grace and personal faith, we are in real but still imperfect ecclesial communion because we share the mediating elements of sanctification and truth given by God through Christ and the apostles. The Catholic Church and the churches and ecclesial communities of the Reformation both participate in the attribute of apostolicity because they are built up and live by many of the same elements and endowments pertaining to the one and multiple apostolic tradition. So here's one of the most important theological shifts of the Second Vatican Council, uh, which provided really the foundation for Catholic ecumenical commitment. When the, the bishops of Vatican II chose to no longer regard the separated brothers and sisters as heretics and schismatics, but recognized in their ecclesial life, in the corporate reality of their faith life together, um, these elements of truth and sanctification which belong to the one church. When I speak about these uh, teachings to my students, the reaction I get often is that this sounds like um, tentative or timid language to contemporary ears, but I think we need to understand what a decisive step this was towards a recognition of other churches and communities that opens the way today for a fuller recognition of the communion that we already share, albeit in differing degrees. Lutherans as well have reassessed their views of the Catholic Church in light of the many recent developments in Catholic teaching and practice. They no longer consider the Church of Rome to be a false church. Luther himself had insisted that a manifold Christian substance must be recognized in the Roman Catholic Church. The apostolicity study invites us to draw the consequences from these reevaluations and to give full weight to the wide ranging agreement on essential matters in Lutheran, Catholic, teaching, and church life today when it affirms that we mutually recognize at a fundamental level the presence of apostolicity in our two traditions. Both carry within them the principal practices by which the gospel is meant to shape the life of the church in continuity with its apostolic foundation. Substantial agreement on the essentials of ecclesial life 
creates a new context for considering our remaining differences in institutional forms and practices. The dialogue contends that growing ecclesial recognition must be met by more concrete measures. This would include steps towards the mutual recognition of ministries, which according to Catholic teaching remains the principal motive for a differentiated recognition of Protestant communities. Further, the apostolicity study maintains that the high level of agreement on the question of succession in the faith, symbolized by the signing of the Joint Declaration on Justification, touches, quote, the heart of apostolic succession, unquote. The signing of the Joint Declaration, it says, implies the acknowledgment that the ordained ministry in both churches has, by the power of the Holy Spirit, fulfilled its service of maintaining fidelity to the apostolic gospel regarding the central question of faith set forth in the Declaration. So it moves from substantial consensus on the apostolic faith and proceeds to consider the apostolicity of ministry, asking whether Lutheran and Catholic authorities might be able to affirm a differentiated consensus regarding ministry by accepting the possibility of differing structures which realize and serve the fundamental intention of the ministerial office, that service of the apostolic faith. While this study has yet to be formally received by the churches, I think it reflects this growing consciousness of how deeply we are related. Recognizing in each other the lived reality of the one apostolic faith, and thus an expression of the one apostolic church, is akin to affirming that Lutherans and Catholics have the same DNA. Through dialogue, we're coming to recognize that the same basic genetic information is carried in the living cells of Lutherans and Catholics, the same basic pattern that gives life to the ecclesial body of Christ. We're coming to recognize, after 500 years of estrangement, how closely we are related to one another. So this coming year, there will be, I hope, and I hope you're planning and looking forward to uh, opportunities to gather together for common prayer, common study, and common witness in ways that can help Lutherans and Catholics to recognize one another more fully as members of the one body of Christ who have been justified by faith in baptism. A number, of, uh, I mentioned um, from conflict to communion, it presents in fairly separate, uh, simpler terms, some of the developments that I've been trying to describe here. After noting the ecumenical and global context for the joint commemoration, and these new perspectives emerging in ecumenical dialogue, it provides a common historical overview of the Lutheran Reformation and the Catholic response, one free from the anti-Catholic or anti-Protestant biases that characterized the oppositional readings of our history in the past. Reappropriating this family history together is an important act of healing and correcting our collective <coughs> memories. From Conflict to Communion also explores key themes in Luther's theology in light of our emerging consensus, including justification, Eucharist, ministry, scripture and tradition, and the church. In the final two chapters, it sets out the conditions that ought to characterize our common commemoration of the Reformation. We recognize what is common and joins us together, as well as what continues to divide. We prepare to remember together the events of the Reformation as members of a still divided body where division 
still undermines our ability to manifest the full Catholicity of the church. The text says, the first is reason for gratitude and joy, the second for pain and lament. So even those liturgical celebrations should be celebrations of our common faith, but always with a note also of repentance. Lutherans rightly wish to share with others their gratitude for the many gifts and insights from Luther and other reformers that have shaped their ecclesial traditions. Catholics can rejoice with them following the impulse of the Second Vatican Council that they must gladly acknowledge and esteem the truly Christian endowments which derive from our common heritage and which are to be found among our separated brothers and sisters. The decree on ecumenism reminds us that anything wrought by the grace of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of our separated fellow Christians can be a help to our own edification. At the same time, we will uh, remember together the failures of the past, including the dark side of Luther's teachings and the polemical debate that ensued on both sides. From conflict to communion observes with good reason, Catholics and Luther, Lutherans frequently not only misunderstood but also exaggerated and caricatured their opponents in order to make them look ridiculous. There's some great old medieval cartoons, you know, Luther with seven heads, the Pope is the Antichrist. Uh, so uh, we, we remember and regret these um, uh, misrepresentations. It says here, and uses very strong language, they repeatedly violated the Eighth Commandment which prohibits bearing false witness against one's neighbor. So we want to commit ourselves to not doing that today. Shared responsibility and guilt for the unfortunate manner in which past debates were, connect, were conducted must be openly confessed as we commemorate the Reformation together. And so these notes of common joy and repentance will are present through the, the study materials, but also through the liturgical materials. And the, the, the text from Conflict to Communion concludes by setting out these five ecumenical imperatives. And the lit liturgy for the celebrations or commemorations also invite us to commit ourselves to these five imperatives that should characterize our commitment to move forward together. The first is that we will always begin from the perspective of unity and not from the view of division. It's easy to focus on our differences. We want to underline the communion that we share that is always greater than what, than what continues to divide us. And some of those differences are not church dividing. They're just a reflection of our different ecclesial ethos. We also commit to let ourselves be continually transformed by encounter with the other and by the mutual witness of faith. This requires that we actually make a commitment to go out and meet one another. Uh, not just wait for others to come and visit us, but, but be ready to, to, to go and, and perhaps join Lutheran communities or Catholic communities in their places of worship, um, work together in, in places of common uh, social justice and service commitments, where look for the places that we can um, really allow ourselves to get to know each other more deeply. We commit ourselves again to seek visible unity. Uh, we're not going to throw up our hands. Uh, and it, and it, the language says, in a sense, we strive repeatedly towards this goal. It's uh, like the life of a monk. We will fall down and get up and fall down and get up but we need to have that commitment to stay in the journey together. We rediscover together the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for our time. The goal of Christian unity uh, is not an end in itself. Church unity is not the end. It is really 
Church unity must be at the service of our witness and, our, and the mission of the church in the world. So um, we need to be aware of the message that we proclaim together in the world. And then we commit ourselves to witness together the mercy of God in proclamation and service to the world. To grow in these attitudes, we all need to undergo a continual conversion of heart that is essential to all genuine ecumenism. Let us take every opportunity to live more intentionally as brothers and sisters who belong to the one body of Christ. Let us embrace these imperatives together and allow ourselves to be called anew into community, to create new memories together as one body, one family, reconciled in Christ. Thank you. We do invite you to step forward to either microphones to pose any questions or comments to Kathy. was not here for Dr. Clifford's lecture. And the reason is I'm 94. <laughs> uh, but she graciously uh, gave me an advanced copy. And I would like to make a few remarks. First of all, it's a stunning paper very carefully researched, uh, very carefully nuanced, I want to assure you, as one who has studied in Germany under Lutherans, that uh, this does not come out of a group who had warm feelings for Catholics. The uh, lecture is text-based. It's based on the text. It is a, uh, a very open very positive uh, presentation. I have a second question, and that has to do with a man called Erwin Isserl. You know of him? I do, yes. Great Luther scholar. Yes, great Reformation scholar. Uh, he was my teacher uh, when I was in Germany. Uh, he wrote a scholarly paper uh, declaring that the 95 theses were never tacked to the door of Wurttemberg. Uh, the Lutherans were up in arms. I mean, this was the symbol of the Lutheran position. And uh, of course they were up in arms. Uh, I do not know what the further conversations and research uh, ended up with. I do not know uh, that history. 
I've been out of Reformation studies for some years. Uh, but I would like to uh, ask Dr. Clifford if she could say something. Uh, Ezerlo was contradicted by, by many other scholars. Okay. So it's, it's one view. I, I don't think it's... It's not the it's, view. Yeah, it's not the only, only perspective. I think uh, Dr. Rinder connect could probably add more Sorry to put you on the no, spot, no, Jacob, um, but you're fresher on this than I am. I'd say the sort of majority view at this point is that it's likely that they were not actually posted on the door because that was not as common practice at the time as, it, um, as has been sometimes argued, uh, but that they were certainly posted for public discussion uh, and were um, not the thing that Luther thought would blow up the conversation. He thought this was a minor side point important but not his major contribution yeah and he uh, thought that a, a couple of earlier documents would probably have been the things that would have um, that would have fostered discussion and so the fact that they that the 95 theses turned out to be as important as they were historically was a surprise it seems to everyone involved thank you yeah thank, thank you Dr. thank you look where a discussion starter got him <laughs> I was a seminarian here in the early 70s. In 71, three of us went to Luther Seminary for a quarter, and three Lutheran seminarians came here. And the six of us all agreed that it made us better Christians. Uh, we had to think of uh, things from another perspective and understand better ours. One of my classmates uh, uh, left the Roman Catholic priesthood, became a Lutheran pastor so he could marry. Uh, and in visiting with him in the last couple of years, he said the uh, most painful uh, part of pastoring in the last number of years has been uh, homosexuality in the Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Communion. And uh, so as we talk about union, there's uh, what about union within the Lutheran communion, especially uh, concerning homosexuality? Sure. I think the Anglican uh, communion is also feeling Very much. great tensions, and, and I think you could extend that into many Reformed families. And in the Catholic Church, we're only beginning to take the lid off and begin a conversation on, on some of these questions of human sexuality. So I don't know what the answer is. I think that. Um, the conversations that are, have, are going on in some ecumenical circles, um, especially through faith and order in, in Geneva, have tried to frame the question not in terms of how we interpret the scriptures and human sexuality, but how do we come, how do we discern what the gospel requires? And um, my sense is that Part of what under is, is it's also um, putting a chill on ecumenical relationships because when other churches, whether they're, they're ch churches within our own ecclesial communion, our own confessional family, or, or between churches, when other churches arrive at a decision which, with, with which we cannot abide, it seems to undermine our faith in their processes of discernment and decision making. So uh, I think uh, there's some interesting conversations, or at least people are beginning to raise the question, or to say, perhaps a way forward is for us to try to come to a common understanding of criteria for discernment and processes for making these kinds of decisions. And the other thing is, I don't think we have begun to understand how greatly culture factors into these uh, all of these questions. So you'll see confessional families now beginning to fracture along cultural lines as the Anglican uh, communion is beginning to do so. It's, it's, and it doesn't make any of us um, uh, happy to see this happen. But there are questions we all must face. And the question is, can we, can we find a way to stay together um, 
and, and my sense is about of some North American uh, communities um, is there's a there's such an impatience with these questions, uh, and and people are not willing to wait until there's consensus across the worldwide communion, and so so it creates new division, unfortunately. Complicated answer, sorry. We have time for a couple more questions. You're going to get me back now, Jacob. No. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to flesh out, since I know it's where you're doing a lot of your work right now, um, on the Second Vatican Council's uh, recognition of the notes of the church outside of the boundaries of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, I've spent this semester um, trying to go back through the, the discussions in the Secretariat for, uh, for promoting Christian unity during the Council to see what they really meant by this idea of the elements of the church. And, and they were clearly looking for a new language. We needed new language, and we needed a language that it was a language that was also shared by other Christians, because this is language that is used um, in the, um, the Toronto Statement of the, uh, the basis for the World Council of Churches. And so um, I think it's interesting to, to watch how this evolves. And I'm, I'm, my, commit, my, my conviction is that we really haven't received this fully or understood fully um, the theology behind it. And um, for example, when we hear statements like there are only elements of the church in other communities, it, it, there's a kind of perception that this means a bunch of disparate fragments and leftovers. Uh, but that's not in, at all how this language is intended to, to be meant. And um, in this document on the apostolicity of the church, uh, there's the hand of Jared Wicks, who's, and you hear this term, there's a manifold of elements. They're all interconnected. They can't be dissociated. So, th so they're, they're, the whole of ecclesial life is interconnected. The sacramental life, the life of preaching, the life of Christian discipleship. And, and they're corporate social realities, mediators of divine grace. Um, and you, we can't say anyone is, they're mediators actually of salvation. So we might say, we might see, perceive these as partial realizations of the church or less than perfect realizations of the church. But nobody says that you're imperfectly or partially saved. <laughs> you're saved or you're not. <laughs> so I, I just think that there's, a, there's something there that we need to... Um, understand in more broad and generous terms and, and perhaps exploit more fully. And making this connection with apostolicity, I think, is a really sharp um, insight. And that might help us to do it. And it also gets us past the question of apostolicity and ministry and apostolic succession. You, we cannot put Humpty Dumpty back together again if there's been an interruption in the in a succession of ordination. But we do have to create the conditions again when ministers, superintendents, overseers, bishops of other churches can be received again into the college, the, the apostolic college or the Episcopal college. Um, and that has to be a mutual process. It can't be a one-way process. So I'm kind of musing with all of these things and trying to think about how we can frame it more broadly. And I, that one of the reasons I wanted to draw on this tonight was I think this is a really important insight. So there's another question here. I guess uh, my question is, is there an uh, ex existential um, question going on among Christians? Is there going to be, will there be um, Christianity in the future? 
It's a, it's a fair question. One of my teachers was Father Jean-Marie Thiard, great Dominican theologian and ecumenist. And near the end of his life, he gave a lecture um, in Quebec City. And um, he gave the text to a Canadian uh, journal at the, at the time, the Catholic New Times. And the editor called me and said, oh my god, this is so negative. I don't know if I dare, do, I, do we dare to publish it? The title was, Are We the Last Christians? And his fear was that we're losing really the importance of creedal Christianity. And we see, I mean, there's been a great evolution in the, in the last century in, in the rise of more charismatic movements um, uh, and evangelical Pentecostal communities that do not value um, that apostolic continuity, that, that creedal faith, that sacramental life. Um, and so he was kind of scratching his head and saying, you know, is, are, we, are we still committed to being this kind of Christian in the world today? I think it's a vital question for those, those of us who do belong to churches who come from that tradition. It's, it's indispensable for us to get together and to give a common witness and so that we can, we can also say in our conversation with Christians belonging to these other movements, our conviction is, you know, this is essential to who we are as Christians. And there's something really uh, for you for you also to discover, many Pentecostal scholars today are now turning to Trinitarian theology and are, are reading the Church Fathers and are looking at the importance of, of creedal faith. So I think we're not, we're not as far apart as, as we think, but um, if we, we might, I think the great danger would be if we miss the opportunity to be reconciled and give a common witness in the world, it would be disaster, not just for us, but for the world. So, so we really do need to take more concrete steps together. Pope Francis has called us to, to walk together with other Christians. And when he uses this language, I think he's playing a bit on the word of synodality. Living synodality means being on the road together. And he has, I think, a sensibility of, about how important it is for us to live into unity together. But it means we have to commit ourselves to doing everything possible that we can together. When we shouldn't forget how important the work of theological ecumenism is also. They have to go together. And all of that really valuable theological work, I think the dialogues have been one of the most important examples of a sustained, systematic, theological development in common that's being done in our churches. And if we fail to receive it, we're going to lose a great, great insight and a great opportunity to renew the life of our churches. So, thank you. We have one, time for one last question or comment. Father Killian. Yes. It would be. So this is not a, this is not a dead end. This is a opening to the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we remind you there's books here for sale, and we invite you also to the back refreshment table. Thank you. Happy.